Well, thank you well. for coming on Wolfcast number four. Well, thank we you for inviting us to my house. <laughs> we did Wolfcast number three earlier today. This morning. Yeah, mm -hmm. with uh, Adam. And now we got Mama and Papa Bear here. Yes. How'd it go with Adam? It went good. It went good. It was mm -hmm. good. You getting better at it as you're going along? Yeah. Yeah, it was a different flavor than the previous ones. I'm sure it was. Yeah. Yeah. So. So who's the host? Are you co-host? Who does all the talking? We're co-hosts. We're co-hosts. Equals. Equals. <laughs> Equals in the eyes <laughs> of God. Okay. Who mm. <coughs> does most of the well, talking? Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> thank you for agreeing to come on. I didn't. So, you know. I was sleeping in like a Shanghai in here. <laughs> well, let's start off with a nice toast here. Okay, okay. I'll drink to that. Prost. 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 I'm prosy. Get your chip out of here. Is <laughs> <laughs> this your um, part of the tradition of the wolf cast? Yeah. Except for this morning. That, that was, that oh, was the coffee, coffee one. Yeah, I mean, you have to Ah, uh, it depends the time of day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. Don't want to be dangerous. Well, the end of the day, it's, it's beer and, you know, chips. Yes. So, I'm excited to have you guys on here because both of you have, have a certain experience that will meld together makes for a good conversation. You on one hand, right? You're a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Yep. We we'll deal with all the crazy people we have. Ah. Uh. Yeah, I'll, we'll have to clarify some of that. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's that sums up your job, right? That's crazy talk. <laughs> well, that that just... sums up the stereotypes out there. Yeah, hmm. you deal with crazy people, um, <laughs> and you are a gun enthusiast and a small business owner for a business that's been around for almost a hundred years now. That's true. It's incredible. Yeah. So, and unlike is... mommy, my crazy people aren't getting the help they need. <laughs> That's then true, maybe I can attest to that. Them. <laughs> I can attest to that. Some you can have a referral service. <clears throat> but I do hand out mommy's card to all my customers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Um, so, why don't we start off by explaining a little bit about, you know, what you do, what your normal day entails, and what brought you to this career? Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. That's a big question. I can leave. I'll be back in two <laughs> hours. <laughs> um, well, I'm a, okay, so I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, I'm a nurse practitioner that decided to go into psychiatry, but there's obviously there's lots of different kinds. Um, there's family nurse practitioners, there's cardiac nurse practitioners, pediatric nurse practitioners, just every kind you can imagine, just like there are different kinds of doctors. Mm -hmm. So um, to be a nurse practitioner, you first have to be a nurse, and then you go on for more training to be a nurse practitioner and that additional training allows you to actually treat patients and you know, diagnose and treat and prescribe medications um, so it takes nursing you still have the nursing philosophy but you take it a step further mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to go into psychiatric nurse practitioner because I've always been interested in psychiatry, mental health. I mean, I remember talking to friends, like when I was in elementary school, like helping them through things. Like I was always- Elementary school. Yeah, I was always the one- What were they going through in elementary school? You, yeah. Just Whatever kids go through. Like, listen, everybody has their stuff. Yeah. I'm behind on this, on this <laughs> month's rent. My wife just left me. <laughs> but all throughout, the I always parents was fighting. People. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bullies. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on with kids. Yeah. I don't remember so. too much from elementary school. Well, I remember a lot. I have Maybe a really I good memory. Maybe I just <laughs> awesome. Those are the only memories that were made. <laughs> So, um, Mommy remembers everything. I do. I have a very good memory from childhood. She does. She remembers things when she was four years old. Yeah, even younger. Like 18 months old. What I have memories from 18 months. What was the earliest memory? It's dark in here! Let me out! <laughs> <laughs> I remember being having my diaper changed. 
That's freaky. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do because. It was like consciously knowing, like. Right? Yeah. I do. I remember because. Did you ever like so purposely I, like. Yeah. <laughs> no. I remember sitting laying dramatic. there and my mother's cousin was there and her kids were there. And they were watching, they were boys, three, three boys, and they were, you know, they're like a few years older than me. And I remember them looking at me and laughing and walking away, and I remember their mother's face. And later on, I asked my mother, what situation would that have been that I was laying there and I was there with this, because this woman is my mother's cousin, and those kids are my second cousins. And it turns out that that was, she, I stayed there for three weeks while my mother had her gallbladder out and she recuperated. Her cousin took care of me and she was 20 years old. I was um, taken care of by her cousin and she says I was 18 months old at the time. So that's how I know that I, that, that was a memory from when I was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. And um, I have other memories of like one particular one being in a crib in an apartment and I was crying so like if I was in a crib I mean I and I know I was in a regular bed at like three or four so that was before that age so like I do have a few memories and a lot of memories from three and four and on mm -hmm. anyway <coughs> digressing off the question um, I so remember yeah. this morning <laughs> So um, I always liked mental health, I always liked helping people, I always thought it was interesting about how the human mind works, what, you know, disease minds where people are depressed or, or have like abnormal psychology. When I was in college, I, um, I actually majored in psychology, but I really liked the abnormal psychology class. I just thought it was so interesting, talking about schizophrenia and everything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's where the seed got planted, but then I sort of got detoured and I, I ended up, I mean, I got my psychology bachelor's, but then I went a whole different route for a while. I was doing actuarial math, working in an insurance company. Then I, I went- I told you this was gonna go for two hours. Then I was, <laughs> <laughs> then I was a math teacher for a while, but then I kind of came back around and I knew I really wanted to do that and I should have stayed in that direction so I decided to go back to school mm -hmm. and um, at first I was just gonna do like mental health counseling like a like a social worker type thing but then I was talking to somebody who was a social worker and and this guy advised me like well if you're gonna do this why don't you do ner be a nurse pract a psychiatric nurse practitioner because you can deal with the same population and do a lot of the same things but you could do so much more. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Oh, well, you know, you can actually diagnose, you can prescribe, I mean, it's very much in demand, blah, blah, blah. So then I, I mean, that really piqued my interest and I decided to look into it. You missed the first part though. Psychology wasn't the first thing. Oh, well, music education was even before psychology. See that? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. When I true. met her, she was all about music. Yes, that's right. I was a music education major. How, how did you guys meet? I heard That's a story, an, had, and it sounds like it's a myth. A myth? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so tell me what you heard. Let's hear, let's hear what you heard I first, heard and we'll tell you if it's true or not. That you guys met at a country dancing club, and that you had a boyfriend, but he came and asked you out, but you had to say no because you had a boyfriend. Correct, right. And then... She rejected him. Yeah. That's what happened. <laughs> it, was a, it was a hard line rejection. He came up... <laughs> You had to take the courage to ask her out. Yep. He comes up, you know, he's he's all nervous. He goes up and asks her. And she and shot like, me Get down. Get out of my face. Get I out of here. Not. I liked him, but I didn't know what to do because I'm not that kind of person that she's no, not. Wait a minute. That, that's not where we met, though. No, we met in my mo my mother had a dance studio. And <clears throat> she taught all kinds of dance, but she started teaching country western dance. It was like, because at that time it became very popular, country music again. So she started working at a place called Sundance. Is that um, a film company? No, it was a country western dance club. Music in Bayshore. Club in Bayshore. And so she started working like Saturday nights and, and maybe Friday nights teaching lawn dancing there. And also she would like recruit people to come to her studio if they wanted to learn more. So um, I went there, she would drag me along, which at first I didn't know what I 
was going to expect, but I actually liked it. And he was in one of her classes. And so I met, actually, I first met him in one of her classes when I was at, she asked me if I could sub for her because I learned everything. So I was like, okay. So I saw him. He was my student. And I was oh. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> So I asked the teacher like, out. He's, he's kind of cute. Oh, that's he's kind of cute. <laughs> So um, like, you didn't you didn't need that much detail. Student bond. <laughs> yeah, that would so, be illegal now. So, um, but whatever. I mean, I was going out with somebody, but then several weeks later, I went with my mother to the dance club place, and he was there. And I had told her, I was like, "Oh, there's this one in your class that's really cute." So she saw him, and, she, and I was there. <laughs> so she drags him over, or drags me over to him. Drags me to you. I don't, I don't remember, remember which way it went, but. And remember when like, you were 18 months old, but you don't like, remember that? Oh, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is Bob. He called himself Bob at the time. I don't know he called why. called himself Bob at the I time? I do not know why. Hey, Bob. I was, yeah. go I, I was going through transition. <laughs> I heard there's phases of the name Robert where it's like you sa start out at Bobby, and then it transitions into Robbie, and then Robert, and then Old Man Bob. <laughs> old man Are you going to become Old Man Bob one day? I think he passed that. Yeah. I'm old already, huh? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> See, I'm way past that. Okay. So I come and I get insulted in my own house. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so um so that we hit it well so she introduced us, but then at the end of the evening he asked me out and I was like out to dinner and I was like, oh, I can't, I'm going out with somebody. So You just said and then no. I went home Loser. and I kicked myself home the whole way home. I was so mad at myself. I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't have done that. So then the next time I took him up on his offer. <laughs> How'd you kick yourself all the way home? Yeah, it wasn't easy, but I did. Seems really hard. But yeah. She goes, oh, she, I'd like to take you up on your offer. Like, what offer? <laughs> I'd, so like that. I'd like to, but I got a date for Meanwhile, tonight. Meanwhile, like three, so three weeks, see, because the thing was three weeks later, I was going to be leaving to go away to school because I was only 18 and I was supposed to go away to Virginia to this music school for music education. So then I was like, well, I was supposed to break up anyway. We had agreed we were going to break up anyway. So I'm like, why would I say no to him? We we're going to break up anyway. This is stupid. So then I, that's why I took him up on his offer. And for the whole first year, it was like a long distance. Mm. I mean, and we there were no cell phones. There was no like video chat. This was the olden days. Yeah. You know, it was just, I sat in the hallway in the yeah, dorm like waiting for generation. the... <laughs> yeah. I sat in the hallway waiting for the... the Pay phone to ring. Monday night phone every call. Monday night he would call me, and I'd get really mad if there was somebody on the phone. I'd be like, "Get out, bitch, you man!" <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we would be on the phone like for over an hour. Wait, so you were willing to go long distance with this guy that you like barely even that met I only met three weeks. You were yeah. so ready to break up with the person you're already. Yes, yeah, right. I know it like, doesn't make this, any sense. Forget this old schmuck. <laughs> doesn't make any I'm glad sense. Him. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess, I don't know that we were. I guess we were going out. He sent me letters, like three or four letters a week. But when did you leave and when did we start this actual going out thing? I don't know. I mean, I just know we had this long distance relationship. And then after I came back the next summer, you, you asked, you, we got engaged. This is another <laughs> whole story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mommy, that. mommy asked me to marry her. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was at Christmas when I came home for Christmas that first year of school. So he was like really shy. I was like, oh my God, he's so shy. So I'm like, you know, if you asked me to marry you, I wouldn't exactly say no. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. <laughs> I can't believe it either. We now we're in this big mess because of you. So then the next summer he, he ended up proposing. And then he got upset because, I'm sorry. He got upset because I didn't 
when he asked me, I took like a few seconds to say yes. It was a half an hour. It was no not sense. a half you're an the hour. One that, you're the one who asked him. Right. You're, then you're then the I ask you and you're like. Exactly say no. I then he comes and asks and then you just don't answer. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a cup of coffee first. I'll get back to you. What kind of garbage is that? I wanted him to know that I was thinking about it carefully. Yeah, yeah, so of course you were thinking about it. You asked me. It's a question that you don't think about. Like, yeah. so here's what the moment. I wanted it to be a moment. You I told me to ask you. Why would you not have thought about it? It makes no sense. <laughs> well, you're crazy mind can think of I figured that. if I asked, it was in the bag. It was not a half an hour. It was just like a few seconds. You it was not a few seconds. I heard it was a week. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we were at Argyle Lake. We started in the morning and it was sun was setting by the time Babylon. you answered. It was at Argyle Lake in Babylon. Right mm -hmm. by the water. Interesting. So But anyway, so yeah. um so where were we? Yeah, you were just getting into your nurse practice. <laughs> oh yeah. So um <laughs> so I decided you know, I was I would look into the nurse practitioner thing. So then I was actually looking at well, what would it be to be a psychiatrist? Because essentially you do the same exact thing, and I really like that idea. But you know, it was just such a long haul, and I was already forty four or forty three at that point. So I'm like, if I do that and all of that, how much time will be there for me to actually work as a doctor? So mm -hmm. I figured, you know, the nurse practitioner was just a little quicker. And I could still do the exactly the same job. Of course, the money is not as good as a psychiatrist, but it's still, you have all those loans to pay. And being I was already 43, it didn't really make sense to go to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. But if I could do it over, I would. I would, you know, way back to the beginning. If I knew now what I knew then, what I knew now, I would have definitely done that. <clears throat> what was it? Hindsight is always 20 20. Yeah. So we've, we've now seen how you've gotten up to this point. So now we're gonna turn our attention to you. <laughs> so, um, oh wait, hold on. Actually, where did you, so all right, so here's what we're gonna do, right? We'll find out where did you grow up? Cause we didn't answer that either. Oh. We don't know where you grew up. Oh you my from? God, you bet I, you'll get to me tomorrow. <laughs> This I, is going to be a whole new podcast. I grew up, I lived in a lot of different places, but I guess up until I was eight, I lived in Ridgewood, Queens. I was born in Glendale, which is right next to Ridgewood. Lived in Ridgewood from like one year old to like eight or nine, I think. Then I moved upstate and I lived upstate <coughs> in a place called Marlboro, which is near Newburgh, right on the Hudson River mm -hmm. in apple country. Mom um, used to steal apples. Yeah, on the way home from yeah. school, I used to be an apple. You hop over the fence and pick apples. No, there was no fence. No fence. Although I don't, I can't tell you how much pesticide I must have eaten, because when I grabbed the apple right off the tree, I I did rub it on my shirt, but like oh, yeah, I didn't wash it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was. Just <laughs> grab on the shirt. I mean, they rub used to go through those shirt, trees. Work. They used to go through the trees with these machines, like whoosh, like a a shower of this stuff up and down the rows. Whatever, I'm okay, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I lived there until I was 14. And then I moved to Long Island, and I lived in North Babylon, which is where I graduated. Okay. All right, so. I grew up in Queens, too. Okay. <laughs> then I went Queens. to school, then I went to work, and now I'm here. Where in Queens? Jackson Heights. Okay. Jackson Heights. So. Interesting thing. We used to go down to the park and play stickball. Really? <laughs> So did our previous guest. I know. Well, he knows because I always make fun of him. Oh. What? With the, you guys want to play some stick ball. I used to play stick ball. Certainly. 85th so, Street Park. Why not just use a baseball bat? Why a stick ball? <coughs> because it's not Please. as far. It you didn't have that far to go. No. So, so, so like, a stick everything was wants it so it didn't go as far? Well, it's just a stick. It's like a, a broom handle. That's okay. all it is. And you're hitting like a, a round rubber ball. So the purpose is because it's for small spaces. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, now I learned something. I'm glad. <laughs> so, what led you to the profession that you are in now? Grandpa told me that's what I had to do. <laughs> well, he didn't, I I didn't, he didn't like any of my other choices. 
And when I stopped going to school, he said, you got to come to work with me. So all your other choices? Stay in school. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you had other choices in mind, right? You know, you were going to school, at least. What is your he didn't school. like college at that point. Mm -hmm. What was your college major <laughs> initially? Business. business management. Business. He didn't like it. I mean, you manage a business now, right? <laughs> Seems to work. Well, that's yeah. why his father wanted him to do business management, to manage the business. Now, what about... <clears throat> we did that, and I grew up in the business, learning the trade, so I knew the business. Knew how to talk to people, which so, is the big thing, talking to people. So how was it growing up in, in Queens? I feel like that was an interesting place that a lot of people have grown up. Our last... Uh, you mean like, uh, was everybody singing on the, on the street corners? In front of the garbage pail, passing a bottle around. Well, because what we were talking about before was um, the mob and well, what was okay. what was kind of going on at least at that point. Oh was, yeah, was, I told you about my mob hit, right? You wait, what? The mob hit you? No. Oh. Uh. Stick with the story, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my friends were walking up the block, 86th Street, and we're looking and we see this this guy in the car slumped over the thing. It's like, he doesn't look too good. So walking, looking. Then my other friend, he goes walking a little closer. And he goes, I think he's dead. <laughs> oh my God. So we called the cops and it was a, it was a mob hit. So was that the thing from Goodfellas? I don't think. Where the kids are going up to the car? No, I don't think so. <laughs> it sounds exactly similar. Well, it is well, similar, but similar. I'm sure it happened uh, in a lot of neighborhoods. Right. Mm. Yeah. How safe was it back then? How safe? It was. I guess it was pretty safe. We used to leave the doors almost open, but then you know it changed. You know, <laughs> well, it, it mean, changed. You know, yeah. gangs came in, and you know things changed. I mean, I in in Ridgewood. I mean, I loved living in Ridgewood. It, of all the places, I that was my favorite. I really it suited me. I you know you play with kids on the block. There's just always somebody to play with. Um, I don't know, like everything is right there. Yeah, right? I mean, you your friends used to come knock on your door and right. you went out. You just till go till right across the street eat. to the grocery store. Like I didn't have just... the grocery store across the street. But no, I did. I yeah. had the airport. We used to play at the airport. We used to go run around the airport and go into all these places and then get thrown out. I, mean, I thought it was more of a big back then. Like you could go on to where the, after the planes were. Well, not really. I mean, that's where you get thrown out. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, we lived in very different parts of Queens. So, like, my experience at Queens, like, where he lived in Queens didn't even seem like Queens to me. It's just very different. You know, I, it, where I was, was there were more, I guess, like apartment buildings. Where he was, was a lot more residential houses. Did I you think. put ice in here? Did you really? There was, uh, there was already ice in there. It was just. I'm like, there's ice cubes in my beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, it was it was in the it was captured in the in the ice box there. And ah. I couldn't break them off, so you know it just you, gotta, you gotta deal with it. Yeah, deal with it. <laughs> but where I was in Queens was definitely more we were more right city like. The, yeah, it was on the border of Brooklyn. Like I was right a few blocks away was Brooklyn, right on the other side. So it was very different. But um, I loved it there. Um, I did not like moving upstate. That was like culture shock. I mean, I went to the boonies from the city. Yeah, the boonies. It was the boonies, and I hated like it. You. Not Suffolk County. <laughs> Suffolk County's the boonies. And they were very, like, the kids there were just, they, they weren't used to any outsiders coming in, so they just didn't accept you very easily, you know, and... It's just I really did not like it there, and then I was very happy to move back to move to Long Island, even though it was different than Queens. But it just I got along better with people. They were more used to people moving around and a little more open-minded, and mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't think you had you liked Jackson Heights, right? I liked it, but then once we started doing upstate, I would wanted to move upstate. Well, that's true. When he they started going upstate, and when he got that flavor he see we're very different on the city mouse and he's the country mouse so how do you guys make a marriage work when you have such differing mm. personalities <laughs> especially you know, i don't know the divorce rate the divorce rate is very uh, high nowadays 
Is it that is. what you hear? Is that the stats you got? <laughs> I don't know. I'm making it up. Oh, okay. I'm pretending to be an expert. Is it, it's e it's easier. It's easier expert. when you make it up because that's what everybody does. Yeah, that's what I do. It's um, you know, same it, values. Yeah. It, when you look at it, it's like, well, what do you consider different and the same? You know, we have a lot of things that we have different interests in, but we do have a lot of the same belief systems. So, um, I think that's what helps. You know. But I mean, at times it's kind of like you definitely have to compromise because he loves upstate, you know, I would love to be in the city going to shows like all the time. That just... That's why you got Adam. And I go, right, I go with Adam because he loves to see show, shows in the city, so... Um, I used to have to do that. You never went to any shows. Yes, we did. I took you to Zorba. Oh, that's true. We're I right took you to another show. Right, I, I took you to shows. Shenandoah, right? Yeah, we I mean, come on. We went to see The King and I. Yeah, Yul Brenner. Yeah, that was good. That was really good. good. But, um, yeah. So, along that kind of vein, when you went back to uh, school when you were 43, so... How, how did it work around the house? Like, it was not easy. <laughs> that was one of, I still cannot believe that I did that. I don't know how I did that. But, mm. I mean, I had a lot of help from Robbie. Luckily, the business, he had moved the business home. And he was working out of the basement. So he was home for when the kids got home from school. And it enabled me to not, ha not have to worry about child care. But... I mean, there's still just lots of household. Yeah, at that, that time, done. it was uh, right before the towers got hit. Mm -hmm. We decided we were going to sell the building on 58th Street and just work out here because we were spending 25 hours a week in the car to get back and forth to the yeah. to the shop. <clears throat> and it was just like incredible time and yeah. wearing on you. So I mean, we had decided little, to do that and. Uh, when they were little, he would leave at like seven Work in the morning, from home. not come home till like seven or eight at night every single day, and it was that was hard. So, you know, it was nice this transition, and then that's kind of what enabled me to do that. But still, plenty of things. It's just hard to juggle three kids. You know, I mean, he did a lot of like picking them up from places and just being there. He still had to do his work in the basement you know, with the, with the upholstery, but um, he did like, we kind of started splitting tasks. You know I don't do mean? upholstery. Slip covers, window treatments. I don't do slip covers. Okay, window treatments? I do those. Okay. I'm the shade, well, I'm the shade time, guy. At that time you did upholstery. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. I never did upholstery, yeah. Oh, okay, you on did. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, <clears throat> like he would do shopping, but then like I did cleaning, I did, he would cook. I did cleaning laundry and like stuff to do with their school like you know oh they need a permission slip and they need money sent in for whatever and you got to go get you know a suit for the for the upcoming concert or you know so it was a lot to try to do that and then go to school and I did work I tutored at that time so putting myself through nursing school I still was working and I worked with tutoring math because I had a, originally done the math education major so I kind of used that to help I don't think they got that on the first run around you didn't talk about the math part. right I kind of skipped that yeah it's like after the psychology thing I went into actuarial science worked in an insurance company and then from there I decided to do math education because I thought it'd be nice I could work during the year be home in the summers with the kids I had the math background so I went for that. I got privately a private certification or independent certification through the state, but I never actually taught in a school. I ended up working for various um, tutoring agencies and also private tutoring. I mean, I did fairly well, you know, but and it was flexible. So I worked during the days. I went to kids' houses, kids who were um, trouble had to be homeschooled. They were suspended for some reason or they had like social anxiety and school phobia and wouldn't go or they were medically had something going on and so during the days I worked for the agencies to, and I went to these kids houses and then after school I would go to kids like private tutoring just regular kids who 
needed tutoring. So, but it allowed me to kind of go back and forth and schedule around other things that I had to do or schedule around school initially. I wouldn't recommend it. Do <laughs> it school was, now. It was very, very difficult trying to, you know, just juggle kids and all the home responsibilities, trying to like schedule all the tutoring, go to my classes, do my homework. Mm -hmm. It just was. <laughs> so, why did you like never just settle for the simple life? Like, what keeps you going to keep? Just like progressing and moving forward. Doing all these different things. Yeah. yeah. God only knows. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, because I, I always visualize doing a profession. Thank you. Okay. And when I had my psychology major, what I really should have done at that time was go for my master's. But circumstances did not allow me to. So then because I, I couldn't really do that, I ended up looking at well, what, what can I do with a psychology degree and I mean they're really just with a the bachelor's there's not that much um, but I found I was looking into different careers and I found actuarial science and I kind of got into it in the, through the back door so to speak I I got myself a job at an insurance company just doing some random it was called uh, surrendering surrenders of policies and then I, re I learned about that there's this thing called actuarial science where you can work as an actuary and you can kind of take the tests as you go. They have these actuarial programs within insurance companies and you take these tests, you get an increase and when you get all a whole series of exams, you, you become a, um, an actuary and they make really good money. So, and I knew I was good at math. I was always really good at math, so I was like, you know, maybe that's what I could do. So I got in with my psychology degree. I got the job. Then I had to convince them to let me. Well, you had the, you had to pass the first two tests, right, the I first two to, exams. Exactly. I had to convince them to let me in their actuarial program. They're not just going to take you in. And they're like, well, you need to pass the first two exams of the society exams. The first one being calculus, and the second one being statistics. So I I passed them both, and then they they. I could tell they were a little resistant, like they didn't think I could do it, really. They, they only yes. usually take Well, they didn't think a psychology major would exactly. kick ass on math. Right. And like, do, do you think that motivates you to like show them? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I put my mind to it, I- But she knew I she do, could do it. Yeah. I mean, the math was not a problem, right. so- And um, like you, they typically would hire people out of Binghamton. They have an actuarial science program in Binghamton. And the MBAs they would hire. Right. So they had almost all the people on the program came from like Binghamton actuarial science program. And I was this oddball that came in as a psychology degree major. From Stony Brook. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, had I majored in math, it would have been a whole different thing. But they didn't think I had that ability. But they also didn't know that I had taken all the math. Because I was thinking about it when I was taking my psychology courses, there was a period I was thinking of being a math teacher. So I had taken a bunch of math at, so at Stony Brook. So that's why I was able to take those tests and pass them. So then they let me in and I did that. And that was also grueling. That was like, I mean, we had no kids at that point. You but sure? still, every day, you come home from work, going into the city, commuting back and forth, spend like two, three hours studying. That and then do it all over the next day. I mean, it was hard, those tests. It was like a 33% pass rate. And this was people who are math majors. It's not just like a general population. So they were hard. And you just had to study so hard. And then you would take the test, and it's like you would fail at half the time. It just was really hard. So I got to the five exam mark, because there's like, at that time, they've changed it. But at that time, there was at the five exams, you became an associate, and at the 10 exams, you became a fellow in the, in the Society of Actuaries. So I became an associate, I got to that point. Um, but then the nature of the tests change in the second half, and they're very much about insurance, you know, about like profit margins, and very business. And I didn't have that background, and no interest in that. So I was, and I had my daughter, then I had Christy. So at that point, I, I got out of the program. I was still working there, 
worked as an actuary, but I didn't progress. And you worked I, from home, though. And I worked, and I they allowed me to work like a part time. You know, they, that was right in the beginning of when you could dial up. You know, with the modems and stuff, the dial-up modems, and I would dial up into their system, and I would work from home. And I had Christy. I worked until I had, I guess, until just before Matthew was born, when I became pregnant. Then I quit. I had Adam. He was like two years old or three at the time. And then when I got pregnant with Matthew, I was like, I just can't do this anymore. So and I hated it. I really didn't like it. it. I wasn't a business person. It's like I, I wandered so far out of my original direction, which was psychology, you know, because I didn't have the opportunity at the time. And, and I was good at math, and I liked the first five tests because it was all about math. But then it, when it became business, it was just like, I just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So um, I decided I was just going to like stay home and babysit and other kids with my kids. So I did that for like three, four years until I, then I did decide, let me be a math teacher. Let me go back to that. At least it's flexible. It's math. Well, I could be summers. home in the summer. Right. So um, I went and did independent certification through Old Westbury, which was also rough at the time. Um, you know, I did like, there was a push about six months where I had to do the student teaching and everything. And the kids were small. Matthew was like four, and he was going to nursery school. Troublemaker. We had him in out. like a full-time nursery, <laughs> and that enabled me to do my student teaching. And I didn't really like the student teaching. It's it's like I did it, and I would feel sick to my stomach every morning going. I would just feel so nervous. Like I, there was just something about being in front of a classroom. I just had social anxiety. I think. And I, I don't know what it is. It's not that I couldn't do it. Cause well, when now I that you're a psych NP, you can shrink yourself. <laughs> when I, at the time, when I would be up, when I do the lesson, I was fine. Like, actually up there, I was fine. I was, like, right there. I knew I did a good job. I knew I could be good. But it, the next day, it was as if that never happened. And I felt back to feeling sick and nervous. I couldn't eat. I just felt, I don't know if it would have ever gotten better. But that's one reason I didn't continue. And then I also had gotten sick at that time. I had gotten like this whole thing. I needed an operation and I ended up having complications. I was kind of out of commission for four months. So by the time I got better from all that, I lost my opportunities to get student, uh, to get jobs. Cause there's like a certain window when you need to apply. When you cut, when you graduate, you know, I graduated in January. Well, not graduated, but I got my certification and then March is kind of like the peak time to be interviewing and getting jobs. I was sick through all that. So when it came to be like May, that window was gone. Nobody was hiring for the next year. And the next year, it was like... The year passed. The year passed. And also, the Twin Towers came down right before I got that certification. And that, I think, changed um, the the availability of jobs because I think a lot of math people in the city fled the city they just were like yeah no we're not working in the city anymore it's too risky and they took jobs out like people who were former business like in math they did they sort of did that too and they started teaching out on the island and it's like when I got back into the picture because after I was feeling better I was not feeling ready to work because it was really an ordeal. I, I was like, I almost died, and I think I went to, through PTSD or something. It took me like a good year to recoup from that whole thing, and when I was finally ready, it was like, my, you know, I was already stale as far as like, well, where have you been working? What, how come you haven't had a job? Like, you haven't worked for two years, you know? And then, and then, and then suddenly, I spoke to one principal, their school principal, and he's like yeah i have like 100 resumes on my desk for math teachers i'm like oh my god no wonder i haven't gotten any jobs you know so then i i just sort of gave up doing that and i just did the babysitting for a while um so i did the tutoring no i did the babysitting then i did tutoring because i couldn't really get a job so i did the tutoring and that worked it was actually flexible but then it was like I had to make a decision either to really push to get a job in a school or 
go back to school and do something else because at that point they were my certification was expiring it so to answer your question while mommy <laughs> was doing all of this i was working my certification was expiring i would have had to go back to school anyway so it's like do i really want to go back to school to do what i need to do to be a teacher which i have butterflies and feel nervous or do i want to go back to the original thing which was something with psychology and that's where I said, well, let me go back and get my master's in psychology and be like a counselor. Except I said, like I said before, that turned into being a nurse, being a psychiatric nurse practitioner. <laughs> and then I'm like, that means I'm going to be a nurse. That means I gotta be I'm a like, nurse. I never in my life thought about being a nurse. And after That's mommy right. was sick, she wanted nothing to do with oh, yeah, medical I anything. Like she couldn't even watch hospital yeah. shows on I TV. I couldn't watch anything to do with medical for like that whole six So months. I couldn't even believe she wanted to do anything medical. Right, no, I couldn't watch a TV show about medical. I couldn't look, physically look at a hospital. I couldn't talk about my ordeal. I started bursting into tears. It was really bad. <laughs> Is it like uh, bananas, kind of bad? Like rotten bananas, you cry, it's like rotten bananas, right? Yeah, I don't know, just all I know is that at that time, I, I was not okay, but it gave me insight into what it's like. And that's another reason I went to be in a psych NP. I, I had a little bit of the world of what it's like to not be okay, like to really not be okay. I really was not okay. Mm -hmm. I couldn't focus on, I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do anything. I was like crying every other day. I was, it was just really I took bad. mommy out to the supermarket to give her a little fresh air and she broke down in the supermarket. Yeah, it was just... It was horrible. Hard time. And so I think a lot of my experiences has helped me be an NP, a psych MP, because now I, you know, people talk about a panic attack. I know what they're talking about. They talk about PTSD and traumas. I know what they're talking about. Um, you know, and I have a lot of the stuff from my past that's helped me with insight into, you know, helping people. So I'm happy with what I picked. So. Thank you for the story. very long explanation. For that forensic yeah. explanation. Now, <laughs> but fine forensic now, explanation. All right, so now I want to get into this sort of debate, okay? Because since both of you have, you know, experienced you with mental health and you with nope. being into guns in the Second Amendment, right? So in this country right now, we have a sort of problem with mentally ill people getting guns and then going and shooting up places. Yes. So, from the perspective of both sides where you know what these mentally ill people are going through and, you know, you have a lot of guns in your, and, you know, you want to be able to keep them, you don't want them taken away and your, you know, rights restricted. So, what do you feel like is, let's say, proper, the proper way to go about this? Should it be making more laws to make it harder to get guns or, you know, properly vetting people more? Or um, should it be trying to get people more help? Like, I don't know, what, what do you think is like... Well, it's tough. Trick? People do need more help, but there's a lot of things in place that should have been working already. There's a lot of red flags that went up with all right. these the people that should have been caught. Right, vetting of people, they're doing a very poor job of that. I mean, there are laws that they're not following. There's, there's, it's all there. Like what laws? Well, I mean, the, the red flags that pop up, that people have called on these guys that shot up whatever place, people have called. FBI was checking them out. They had like, I don't know how many reports on some of these people that no, there, was a, there was a problem and they, they, they dismissed it. Right. So what do you do? I don't know. Yeah. Well, as far as mental health goes, I mean, I think the, the biggest problem is there's just not enough, I don't know how to, it's, it really boils, you know who's the fault? Insurance companies, because they, they don't do pay. not pay for the, the, the mental health that people need. They, I have patients who I have sent numerous times to the hospital who are suicidal. And they send them right back. I mean, clearly suicidal. And kids, not adults, but kids. Now's the time to help them when they're kids. Like, 
that's the time to help where they're, they're going in and they're saying they're suicidal and then they get to the hospital and they're scared about being in the hospital so they then they'll change and they'll say no i'm not suicidal i mean well we sent them they would talk to us and listen to what we're saying you know we're sending them for a reason i mean the kid is saying no they're not but that's because they're scared and often the parent might be resistant and they don't push they're just like yeah okay if they don't push even when they have a good case and they really push to get because there's when they when people get sent to the hospital or go to the hospital they go to an evaluation center of some sort and the evaluation center has people like nurse practitioners like me or doctors who you know talk to that patient and then they have to call the insurance company and basically make a case for them to be admitted and it's I was on that end because when I was interning I interned at uh, New York Presbyterian in their evaluation center and so sometimes I would be the one calling the insurance company to make a case to get that person admitted and you know you have to really care and believe that this person needs to go in and I don't know if some people they just get tired of fighting with insurance companies so that they just don't push anymore. They're just like, they just said, say the case. If they get admitted, they get admitted. If they don't, they don't. And they don't, they don't have that passion anymore to keep fighting because it is a fight constantly with these insurance companies. They'll be like, well, how come blah, blah, blah. Well, what are da And you know, you're like, because I believe that this person is suicidal. I mean, but they have these very strict protocols. And so it's just like, nope, they don't meet requirements. They don't meet the definite whatever they don't meet what we require for them for us to pay where we won't pay and then so you got to send them home because the insurance company didn't admit or you know availability you know they love to talk about on on TV on commercials you know what whatever having are you are you depressed are you you know you're having substance issues you know call the such-and-such -such helpline or call the uh, suicide helpline or and it's a lot of baloney because they call those helplines and it ends up nobody really helps. You know, they, they don't, there's not enough resources out there. They go, they might be sent to some local mental health place and they'll go there or a substance place and they'll go there. And then there's a waiting list to get in. Um, or either they're, they, they consider them, uh, they need too high of a level of care. They call. They love to say, you know, a level of care. Oh, they need a higher level of care. Or they need a lower level of care. And it's kind of a nice way to say, we won't help you. We don't want to take that risk. That's kind of what happens. You know, um, somebody who's very, say they're suicidal, sorry, to our place, they're suicidal. And sometimes it's kind of like, do we want to take them? Because we don't have the resources to help them. We can't see them enough. We can't see them like three times a week. We don't have enough people to do it. They need to go someplace else, but those other places have waiting lists. They may say, well, no, they don't meet requirements. And they send them back to us. And, and so, you know, and then if we're, we're, and I want to say stuck with someone who's suicidal, it's not that we don't want to help, but we physically cannot see them three times a week. We don't have the availability, and that person needs three times a week. But you send them, you refer them to somewhere, and they're like, no, we can't take them. Or the insurance will say, once again, they don't need that level of care. They don't, you can, you know, they don't need it. And that's the problem. It's, it's that there's not enough resources, mostly because the insurance won't pay. They don't pay. You can't hire more people because there's not enough funding from the state. You know, they talk about how they, they're increasing funding for substance and that's because of the heroin epidemic. So that is being increased. And that's only since recently when the heroin epidemic got to be in middle class people. You know, it wasn't like that when it was just among like the poor in the middle, you know, inner cities. But now it's reached Long Island, it's reached you everywhere. Know, everywhere. And so it's reached affluent people's children also. And so, okay, now they've got this big push and that's great, but it needs to be also for mental health and, and they don't have it where it's still, it's just still not enough funding out there. And so you've got people just not getting help. People who are suicidal, people who are just not right. They're like very angry. You know, they have lots of um, 
mood swings and anger problems and so, they're just not getting enough sleep. Another thing is that they're all young men that are doing it. A lot of them, yeah. Well, all of them that do the shootings. True, you're right. I mean, there's mm -hmm. not one young woman that's lately. Got up and yeah, shot up you're right. A school or anything. Right. Why is it all men? Well, I think it's an anger problem. It's. I think it's just a. Re it's an because anger they keep pushing the poor white man down. I don't know if that's it. <laughs> He's lashing out. <laughs> I think what it is is a repression of anger among a lot of young people, and guys do have more anger problems, or at least it comes out in that sort of a way. Women can have anger issues, but, but it's it not. Come well, out that but it's way. not just anger, man. It's you know. Yeah, but that's way beyond well, getting is it, angry. Is it, is it that like guys are more? Get help. Is that is it that guys are more likely to be lethal? With well, you their, look. You look at threats. How guys they, are more like, if they say, like if they say, oh, you know, I'm feeling angry. Like you know, one of these days I'm gonna shoot up the school. You know, is it if if a guy? That's not like a girl, in normal conversation. Like hey, one of these days I'm gonna well, shoot up the school. Well, they're not saying it to people because okay. obviously other people would know. Yeah, but, but saying, they're not getting some. Outside. Some of them do. No, but I'm saying, is it if, if a if a woman were to say it and then like a guy were to say it which one is more likely to go through with it you know well yeah i do i think well i think if anybody's to, saying it we should be looking at them there's something to be well, said yes. for testosterone there is more outward expressions of anger among men than women that they just it's just a, a way of doing it they just do those things but the ultimate problem is that when they were there were symptoms early on but nothing was done about it there weren't enough resources out there and when those people did try maybe to get some resources it was too hard either they didn't have the right insurance that that place didn't uh, accept them and then there's the problem of people resisting people not going you know the boys don't want to they're less likely to go for therapy yeah, they're more therapy. the ones they're more the ones who won't return. I'll see a kid, I'll see the, a girl, and I'll see a boy, and there's, I would say, 75% greater chance I'll see the girl back than the boy. Boys, you know, it's, they don't see it, it's not masculine. They just see it as a sign of weakness. And that's, it gets back to the whole, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the stigma about mental health. Women are more, Likely Mental. to admit that they have that they feel depressed <laughs> and want help. I'm sorry, it's true. <laughs> yeah, but it is. I mean, it's mental. Okay. It is mental health. You know, I mean, but look at them pulling people down with trucks. Men are not. The implement don't matter. It's like they want to do something. They're gonna inflict damage whatever way they can. <laughs> and the laws don't even count. At that point, you think the law matters? Because mass murder, I'm sure, is against the law. Yeah. Right? right? So is mowing people down with a truck or yeah. bombs. Mm -hmm. They're all against the law. Yeah, but I think I think what people I don't know seem to get angry at is how easy it is to get the guns. Yeah, and like an eighteen year old. All right. Someone who's younger than eighteen can get a gun? Is that no, a, someone yeah. younger than eighteen? Not younger than eighteen, eighteen. Eighteen, yeah. Well, so, it might be well, something because, to look at because eighteen-year-olds well, these days are not well, as that's, mature well, that's what as eighteen-year-olds. Like, you know, ago. I remember me and you were talking about once how should the age be twenty-one or eighteen, and you said, "Well, back in your day, you know, and for most of the time, you know, even now it's eighteen, but people back then, I think, were also more mature at eighteen. No, well, I'm now. sure of it. Now they're not mature at thirty yet. It's true. <laughs> It's true, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, and that gets to the, the whole vetting of like, well, who, you know, you need to have a clean record, I think. No, you do. You know, um, there's, I, I don't know. I don't know really the laws about who gets a gun or whatever, but. Well, I mean, now like they got the, the gun shows. Is That was a big uh, thing they were saying. No, they still got, they're still easy. FFLs and they still do background checks. So what's your experience? Like between you go, between private this, people, it's another story. So when you but if, in, if you're in New York or someplace like here, I sell a gun to a private person, it goes to the FFL and it, it's a background check. I don't do a private sale. Who's going to so take that risk because the gun's the on my name? question is, what do they check in the background? If there's any criminal record that comes up. 
Yeah. Does psychiatric history come See, up? See, no, there? and that no. I have a problem with. Because because, because there's a HIPAA law oh, right. that right. you cannot... Right. Well, that seems to be a conflict of interest, then. But, you know, see, I have a problem with that where, you know, I think about that. Obviously, if somebody's, you know, that unstable, they shouldn't have a gun. But it becomes, at what point, when do you say someone's that unstable? And it's a very tricky line. It's a very slippery slope when they say... you got somebody going for depression. They, they're, they're just depressed, okay? They're going through a lot. They feel depressed. They want to go for therapy. Okay, that person's not going to... They're not going to go grab a gun and start killing people. But if you want to say, well, they have psych they, got they psych went meds. for psychiatric help and they're on psychiatric medication, therefore they should never get a gun. And I don't think that that's okay because I have a lot of people that I see that I w wouldn't say that that they are anywhere close to doing anything like that. So I guess that's the question. It's a gray line. How do you decide if you want to look at psychiatric history? Then how do you make the decision? Of how do you know? Then that puts a lot of responsibility, I guess, on this psychiatric provider. Yeah, but if, they're, if they're not even if they're not even like if they're not even giving that information to people when they're doing the background checks, then what uses it? You know, if the the hippo laws, <laughs> if the hippo if the hippo laws are you know not letting people actually see if they can you know evaluate their psychiatric. Condition. Well, I do think the hippo laws have gone over the top. I really do. It's like, yes, I understand everybody, you know, there should be privacy, but it's to the point where it's getting in the way of communicating with other health providers, with family. Like, you can't even tell a parent about their kid's issue. You know, it's a, I mean, there are occasions you can, but only severe occasions. Like, if the kid is suicidal or, or verbalizing they're going to kill themselves or someone else then you can tell the parent. Otherwise, it's still under the HIPAA law. And but only if they're a minor. If they're a minor, right. Yeah. But, and then as an adult, it's like, it just alienates the person from getting the collateral help from the family surrounding them. Because if you can't tell the family anything that's going on, it's, it just makes things a lot harder, you know? So I don't know. Um, so the HIPAA laws, I feel like they went over the top a bit, you know, it's just, you feel afraid to talk to, if a family member calls up and they're concerned about their, whatever, their husband or their, like even husband and wife, right, husband or, or wife or their kid or whoever, and you feel like you can't even talk to them on the phone, like you don't even know what you can say and what you can't say, you can get in trouble, <laughs> now, you know? Now, one of the things that is interesting is we've had the Second Amendment for a while now, right? Obviously, since we first started this country. Mm -hmm. Now, these mass shootings haven't happened until quite recently in our history, you know? Yeah. When, when was the first uh, one? <coughs> it was like in the 70s? Uh, yeah. It was at school. I don't know. Some university? I don't know, but I know, I know, like before, you know, 1950, yeah, it wasn't a thing mm -hmm. that this was happening. So, what is happening with people, you know, in terms of their mental health, where now it seems to be a thing to go to? Is yeah. that you know, we can you know go shoot up a school? Like what, what is going through these people's heads? Is it something that deals with maybe their values, like they just reject? Society and they're rejecting all that it stands mm -hmm. for and they're gonna make a statement by going out there and shooting up You know, there's I think less morals being Instilled. Taught. Yeah, I think there's just a lot where less life is not Focus on like it used to be right like what's the right thing to do the wrong thing to do There's There's more focus on me. It's all about me how things are affecting me It's just more of a me world. more inward. Yeah um, I think that life is more complicated now. You know, yeah, in the I fifties, I, I it just know, was an easier sort of. I, not I don't so know. I don't know if it's if it's about that whole you know own me thing and. I'm well, saying that's one piece of it. It's because, not because because you know, and also instilling morals. Because I mean, you've instilled morals in me, so I have to think that some other parents are obviously instilling you know morals into their kids. But it seems to be that 
there's some outliers that are, you know, going up and like shooting these schools. Well, I think there's just more. It's just even about in the schools, you're not allowed to talk about, you know, any anything like that. Like, you know, they want to respect everyone has their own religion. Okay, but it's to the point where you can't they don't really focus anymore on caring for others. The higher much. power. Or just caring about others in the it's right It's like there's way all different religions, others. but there's always that higher there's power, right? There's less focus right? on it. There's less focus on it because there's a lot of backlash from parents. Well, what are you doing telling my kid that... I don't know. It's just... It's a different society, but I also think it's it's a... Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's it. Because I, I, don't, I don't think... Well, I don't think any well, single thing is well, it. Well, I don't, think, I don't think that's sort of the problem that's driving it where there's not enough... I don't know. Well, Judeo I want to say one other thing. I want to say one other thing. You're letting mommy finish. Complicated. It's complicated now. Life is complicated. Um, there's just so much more pressures on everyone so that I think those people existed back then who had the capability of shooting up a whatever, a school, a public place, but they weren't pushed as over that edge because they just, it wasn't as complicated. Nowadays, it's, it's almost like I don't know. There's you're driving on the road, and there's just more road rage, and you drive. You go to the supermarket, and there's more people. Yeah, I mean, I went to the supermarket on Friday. I got so pissed off by the time I got home because people were just so right. damn rude. Like you go, you go to like the DMV. Oh, like and really? All attitudes, and you just get to the point like, why does everybody have to be so rude to each other? And if you have somebody who's unstable. That's just enough to put them right over the edge. And I think that's the problem. They, you know, the bullying, right? I mean, I think bullying existed in the past, but now you got bullying of people on the internet, you know, on Facebook or whatever. And so they, they get so angry. And again, maybe they were unstable. That same kind of person would have been unstable 40 years ago. But they, they went home and they weren't being picked at on social media. So they could. I think social media can help elevate it. But right. Yeah, because I mean, there is. I mean, if you are that crazy and insane, and you think you know you want to reject the entire world, you could just kill yourself. Get but just, no, do, you, do you, everyone a favor. Just kill yourself. Not but that's shoot up an that, that's school. not that's not. But the it point. seems to be a more a more resentful sort of thing. Where it's like, if I'm gonna go down, exactly, I'm gonna go down with me, or like, and I'm gonna make a statement by killing. Right. The most innocent of people. Right. Like, I'm going to go to an elementary school. And where did I go? To the gun free zones. Right. And obviously, it's also, you know, you see it. Now you plant an idea in someone's head who maybe never would have thought of those things. But now there's this ample way you can look at all the craziest things in the world of how to make a bomb on the internet and all this other stuff. And so. It's just allowed the people who would have been unsteady anyway, but maybe 50 years ago, they just wouldn't have known the first thing about how to make a bomb because you couldn't look on the internet, you know? And I, and I think that's the, the thing. It's just more complicated these days. More um, complicated and easy to find out what you want to find there's out. There's a lot more mixture of um, cultures. So when you're in a more homogeneous, homogeneous culture everyone's the same there's less cl conflict I mean that's just normal right but now we have so many people coming in from all different areas and it people start to clash and people need to learn not to do that but some people aren't able to do that and so that's part of it you know it just wasn't as much clashing it just that's just the way it was so what do you think you know I've always I've always thought about this isn't it weird how there's like a bunch of different religions where one person is saying that this is the right way? Someone's got to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to be wrong. Like we all, so like either you know, there's one person is going to be right, and everyone else is just. I don't think so. Is going to be like losing is, out. Isn't there a lot of? Overlap I think I think whatever That's you believe what is saying. right. There is but overlap in all religions. In no, this. yeah, but it's like whatever you believe is right. Yeah, but it's like, like whatever you know, your religion is is right because that's what you believe. What your religion, religion is because that's what you believe. But I'm saying when, when, when you know but the fat lady sings and we all go and die, what's gonna happen? You know, is it gonna be like, oh man, they were right? <laughs> does, it matter, does it matter to you today what's gonna happen to that person when they die, like in their personal yeah. afterlife? But that's did, but don't you remember like in World War Two, <laughs> they were like saying if God's with us, then who's with them? I don't know. Right? I mean. 
They're, oh, they're on Christmas. They're singing O Tannenbaum. Right. And, and they're singing O Christmas Tree on this side. So right, right. right. They're all I celebrating mean, my Christmas. My belief about that is that all religions, they overlap in their values. You know, they, they basically say the same thing. They just have different ways of expressing it, different, you know, customs or rituals or whatever that that follow those things but essentially i feel if you have a religion then at it's least better you than have no a, religion right you've got you've got a guidance system for yourself to know there's something I mean, bigger than you obviously there are some extreme religions i mean if it's calling for killing people it's a lot of people bigger than me now. you know then it's like <laughs> but usually that's extremists of any religion you know, you have religions that have extremists wife, really. within the religion, and but we have to recognize <laughs> those are extremists. Yeah, they're right. not representative of the right, religion. Right, right, exactly, right. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Well, I'm glad we settled that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what do we have for the time? What do we got? How much time we got? Hour, five minutes. So what is the, we need for commercial break or something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> No. No. I don't know. Do you guys want to wrap it up? Yeah, we can wrap it up. All right. And then I can have more salsa. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for I, coming on here. Okay. I finished my beer. Very good time. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and on my Saturday night, I got all dressed up. <laughs>